Hey, when we ended last week our series in First John, we're almost done with the book. One more week in First John, and then uh, after our campground, I think we'll end up back in Luke. But we went through last week this idea of love, right? Brotherly love, loving your fellow Christian. And there's probably a, a reasonable question that rises up out of that, and it could go something like this. Well, who is my brother? Who is my fellow believer? Who is my sister in Christ? What does that look like? And I think that's actually a question that he answers as we begin to look at 1 John chapter 5. And he says an amazing statement here. He says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the children born of him. You go, wait a minute. That, that is a very, very simplistic statement. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. Well, in a sense, doesn't like kind of most people believe that? I mean, does that mean like everybody who just goes, oh yeah, Jesus is, is a believer. Is that what he's saying here? It's actually not. It's, it is as simple as faith, but it is a little bit more profound if we slow down and understand our terms. For example, the term there that Jesus is the Christ, that means the Messiah. He's the anointed one of the Old Testament. And to believe in him as the Messiah means you believe in him with the attributes of the Old Testament attributed to him. So you do not get to redefine Jesus, which is what is happening in 1 John. They revised the whole program. Biblical Christianity, eh, we got better insight. That's what 1 John is really all about. So it becomes kind of one of two pillars of the faith. So when we understand the Messiah, he is the divine Savior and substitute for our sins. Those three issues when we're talking about Christ are absolutely critical. And so what he's saying here, if somebody believes that, now they may actually express that in a worship service in ways that I take a lot of exception to. And you might go, well, who are you to take exception to? Well, I mean biblical exception. Like, what, what are you guys doing? Like, I'm seeing this. And I say that at a personal experience. Because my wife and I grew up in a liturgical environment. She spent her 20-some years in that environment, didn't understand that she was lost and needed Christ as her divine substitute and savior. And I spent two or three years in that environment. I didn't get it either. So when I say I take exception, like it's because there's a valid reason maybe to take exception. Nevertheless, if somebody believes just that, Jesus Christ is the divine savior substitute of the Old Testament, and God's word says they are Christians, they are a fellow believer. I don't know if any of you follow a very, very, very famous Christian gal, but Beth Moore for example, right? I don't follow her. I know who she is. I don't know that anybody doesn't. She's been around in church. She's written studies and done a number of things. She has come under attack lately for some positions she holds, and I'm not even completely clear on what they are, but I just stand amazed at the amount of ministries that have gone after her. This is your sister, gentlemen. This is your sister in Christ. And if she has a divergent view, well, okay, she differs from you, and you could take exception, but you better not deviate from this. Because what does God say? Do you want to love me? This is what, what, what verse 1 is saying. It's not completely this way, just you and me. That's the end of verse 2. How do you love God? You love the children born of him. Now you, could, you could say, Mike, you're the greatest guy in the world and then treat my kids like rubbish. I'm not feeling like you love me because this is a package deal. And what God is saying is it's not vertical, it's horizontal. You are to love each other. If you take exception, shoot off an email, or maybe you don't necessarily fellowship in those but we have got to come to terms with loving one another. It is truly uh, that, that important. But I want to look back at the first half of the verse here today. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah is born of God. Is it really just that simple? And, and if we were to look back at John chapter 20, verse 31, for example, he says this, he says, but these things have been written, and this is talking about the gospel of John. I've written, he picked all these stories out with a purpose that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John is very consistent here. That is why he wrote the Gospel of John, and that is what he's affirming here. He never, ever t deviates from that, except in, in to use the word receive or accept, which I think is an acceptable synonym. He never, ever deviates from that. And actually, I would say to you, in proper context, none of the biblical authors do. They stay with this idea of believe, believe, believe. It's not because they don't want you committed. It's not because they don't want you to turn from sin or do any of the other things that are essential to a vital, fruitful Christian life. It's because they fully understand that you cannot, 
that you are not capable of anything else because your first birth is infected and needs to be repented of. It needs to be changed your mind. You don't fix the old, you believe on him and he is, then makes you born again and you are a new creation. It's critical that we understand that. And this week, once again, local Christianity in a very famous church was struck by another pastor who took his own life. This is the second one out of Southern California this year. There was another one, I think, in, in near Upland that did it too. Uh, do I believe they lose their salvation? Absolutely not. A bad decision in a moment of utmost depression. It really, that's all it is. That's what suicide is. It's no different than any other... I'm under the gun, I'm under the pressure. The easiest way out of this right now is to lie my way out of it. It's a bad decision, yes? Do we do it all the time? Made a bad decision. But I find this amazing. And I, I don't want to exploit that or make issue with it. I'm sure that young man had some moments of regret with the Lord and he's in heaven today. Okay. But there's those that say no true Christian could ever do that. Therefore, he either lost his salvation or was never chosen to be saved to begin with. But then the thing, that I, the thing that I can appreciate, but then I want to raise my hand a little bit, is those that would agree with me that he is in heaven, that this doesn't affect, it is finished. It doesn't affect, that. it doesn't unfinish anything. Revert back to, yes, he had believed in Jesus Christ. Good. But my, my side question is, sir, why don't you say that when you preach? Why do you feel the need then in this moment of tragedy, you revert back to this critical truth, but in the next massive crusade or in the next massive outreach, your message is different than that. Why is that? Somebody answer that. Why is it we're always running around with these humanistic ideas of what the gospel should be? In tragedy, we revert back to the simple cross. Keep the simple cross, the message of the ministry then. Quit confusing people with all these ideas. And that's what I wanted to focus on today because we have two pillars of the faith. And both of them are constantly under attack. One of the pillars is the finished work of Jesus Christ. It really is just that simple. What he has done. What he has done in your life is not the gospel. It's not. That is the work of the Holy Spirit from somebody who came to Christ. It is not the same as what he did Outside of Jerusalem, 2,000 plus years ago. They are not the same. One is a historical fact that you trust in what occurred in that moment. What did occur? Atonement, propitiation. Jesus Christ satisfied God's holy wrath against humankind. He satisfied it. What he does in the believer's life is different. So what happens in our zeal and our growth is God brought you here and so you try and make the gospel to get other people here. And, and that's really, really concerning. In fact, if we were to uh, move over to the, to the next slide there, this is an example of what John looks at when, it, when he sees and articulates people believing the gospel. This is in John chapter 4, verse 39. And for the sake of time, I won't capture the whole thing, but these are not religious people per se. These are Samaritans. And he met with this woman that we would call a total outcast, fifth or sixth marriage. She's not even at the local well in town where you go to get your water. She knows she's not welcome. So she's out at this deep well out there in the middle of nowhere and Jesus meets with her and he says basically, I am the Messiah. She believes this. She runs back to the town and tells everyone and this was their response. Is this consistent with 1 John 5, 1? Yes. Is this consistent with John 20, verse 31? Yes. Because of the word the woman testified. What? The Samaritans believed. We have no right to tinker with that. Okay? What happens when we do tinker? If you could advance the next one up there. You have a different message. This one, if you look at it, I didn't put the whole thing up there, but in Matthew 7, 15, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is warning about false teachers. You'll know them by their fruit. So we start looking at each other to see who's the false teacher. No, the fruit is not whether the way they dress or their sin. It's their teaching. Otherwise, they wouldn't be considered sheep or wolves in sheep's clothing. In other words, they look the same. But this is the end result. It says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and in your name perform miracles? They did all of this in the name of Jesus. They went around doing this, doing this, doing this. This is their final judgment. This is their plead, their case. This is, this is what we did. Nowhere in the text does it say, didn't, didn't we put our faith in you? Didn't we believe in you? Didn't we? 
No, it's not there. And so this is the end result, verse 23. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Not I used to know you before you committed suicide. Not I never knew you. You did all these religious things because you listened to a false teacher, but I, I never knew you. You never trusted in me. Do you see the difference between the Samaritans who believed and this idea? Guys, it is absolutely that critical. So when we look at a text like 1 John 5, 1, it is not one part of a recipe. As if you have to add the salt and the baking soda because that little just easy, too simple gospel is not enough. And so we're going to pack it with all sorts of things and then we'll present it to people. As if they can help. And then the tragedy occurs... All those things didn't help, did they? Well, let's just revert back to a simple biblical truth. Let's keep the biblical truth to begin with. Be a much better way of doing that. And if you could go ahead and advance that. The next slide that we're talking about is the second critical issue. He says this in 1 John 5, verse 6 and 9. He says, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with water only, but with water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. We can just keep going through them. Uh, for there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that He's testified concerning His Son. Anybody else want to try and unpack that? That's kind of like, okay, what? That's a little bit difficult. Look, if we weed through the whole thing, basically what this boils down to is Greek philosophy had entered into Christian thinking. And it actually, if we study church history, this is just the beginning of it. It got a lot worse. But this idea that, that Jesus was not God that's what this is all about. And their argument went something like this. He was just a man. He didn't even know he was the Messiah, in fact. And then the Spirit came upon him, enabled him to do these things. But no way would the Spirit ever enable his death. And so the Spirit left him before his crucifixion. So what he was saying is, no, 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 no. Okay, there isn't this idea of a spirit of Messiah and then a physical person. So if you, go, if you were to go back to verse 6, he says they are the one. There was one being, okay? And the water there, if you read that, you tend to think, well, maybe that was like, you know, because birth comes through water, the fluid, and the mother's water. So, I, you know, maybe it's that. It's probably not, actually. I think he's referring to his baptism. Why? Because at his baptism, you had the testimony of the triune God. All of them were there. The Son was there, the Father was there, and the Spirit was there. And as He came up out of that water, the Spirit descended on Him as a dove. That's the testimony of this whole thing. But His whole concept here, as hard as it is for us to deal with, is the idea of one being, Jesus. He is the eternal Son of God. Now, the Spirit did empower him in the same way He empowers us because in His humanity, He didn't go out there cranking out zingers of miracles. He did it through the power of the Spirit in the same way that we rely on and trust in the Spirit to work in and through us. In other words, he still remained dependent on the Spirit. And then if you could advance that slide, what you'll see, for example, um, this would be the heresy that I was talking about. This comes from the notes of a heretic from around the second century. And you'll see significant overtones in this that speak to the nonsense that John is dealing with. It says, but Christ, if he has indeed been born and exists anywhere, is unknown and does not even know himself and has no, no power until the spirit of Elijah comes to anoint him and make him manifest to all. And you, having accepted a groundless report, he's indicting you, by the way, a groundless report, invent a Christ for yourselves and for his sake are inconsiderately perishing. Do you see the nonsense? Okay, that's a first century concept that John is dealing with. Just a touch of misguided Old Testament truth in the spirit of Elijah and these things. So you can see someone's peaked in the Old Testament, but they're way off here. So John is responding to this kind of nonsense. So when we look at it, like, John, but dude, I, I, mean, I totally wouldn't have said it that way. Why, you could have been a little clearer because I'm a little tongue twisted after those three verses. Look, the bottom line, 
is this is the type of nonsense that he was refuting, but all of it comes down to the second pillar of Christianity, is who is Jesus Christ? This nonsense, nonsense says he's not God, very God. It says he was like a superhero that some spirit came upon him, right? It's absolute and total and utter nonsense. But if we were to go back to that moment, if you could advance to the next slide. This is what happened at his baptism. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And it's actually neat if you, if you knew a little bit of the Hebrew, but beloved Son means David. So God is speaking down from heaven, and it, it has this kind of one-two punch to it. This is my son, but he's also saying, this is my David. You guys know about King David, what a mess he was. This is the real David. You thought the slingshot thing in the rock was impressive? You haven't seen nothing yet. Watch this. This is the Messiah. This is the prince. This is the one. And so you have that testimony there, and it happened at the water, and the Spirit came down, and that is John's point. As difficult as the wording is in 1 John, the goal of it is to bring us to a point where we understand. And again, sonship to the Jewish mind speaks of equality, and the end result is to be the Son of God to the Jewish mind is to be God the Son. And that also gets a little bit lost because our culture and so forth is different. But moving on from here, the incarnation of Yahweh, and this is what I want to talk about a little bit. Is it just... Uh, my, one of my pet peeve doctrines, like, is it that big of a deal? Well, I suggest to you it actually is. One, because when you place your faith in Christ, it is His righteousness that is gifted to you. So all the wonderful, fruitful things that you do as a Christian, those don't count to get you into heaven because you need the righteousness of God Himself. And that is why when Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, the life, He's pleading with you to trust Him because all the religions of the world can muster up all sorts of neat people but none of them manifest or are gifted with the righteousness of Christ. So there's that issue. And then, yeah, flat out, human blood. Human blood on a cross. But lots of that shed. It doesn't do you any good either. It has to be perfect divine blood. But bigger than that is if we understand the grand narrative of Scripture... If we go all the way back to the garden, he created man, but he wanted a real relationship. Relationships require choice. I don't know anybody in here, grab your wife by the hair or your girlfriend, bonk her on the head with a club, drag her into a cave and say she loves me. It doesn't work that way. Choice. We had a choice. Adam had a choice and he rebelled and he lost paradise. He died. It created this separation now and paradise was lost. But in Genesis chapter 3, God says, you know what? We have to get them out of there. They're now sinful, but they're still in this Eden paradise. And in that paradise was the tree of life. If they eat from that tree of life, it will solidify them in this condition as a sinner. We cannot have that. And furthermore, and this might be conjecture on my part, by ushering them out of the garden, he's showing the world you want independence from God. This is what it looks like. And you can step right outside those doors and see for yourself what humanity independent from God looks like. Turn on the news, go to a third world country, it's magnified, and you go, my goodness. And I find it absolutely amazing that we blame him for the consequences of the independence that we insist on every day. We don't want you in our life. Why in the world are a thousand people starving to death every day? And he goes on trial. Humanity wanted independence and you got independence. We got independence. Amongst the independence is a program, a pursuit, a promise was made. And as the narrative of the scripture advances, what you begin to see is that God is not done with the idea that he and man can dwell together again. That is still the cry of his heart, the cry of the scriptures. And what he did along the way is he gave us glimpses of what that might look like. But yeah, there's them, Genesis 3, 23, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. He knows good and evil, but as you see in the scriptures or in life, can't control it. Knowledge is not victory. Got to get him out of there. He might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live 
forever. That would be bad. Go on to, to the next one there, and I want to talk through a little bit what God did in the, with this tabernacle. Right? He gave them just a little bit of a glimpse where his presence would manifest themselves to him. And our Jewish friends called that the Shekinah glory. Have you heard that phrase before? It's not so much an Old Testament phrase as it is a phrase out of the Jewish language. So whenever God manifested himself out in the wilderness, if it was fire, that was the Shekinah glory. If it was a cloud, that was the Shekinah glory. Whatever it was, however God was manifested, that became known as the Shekinah glory. And then they built the temple. And the temple would be like the next phase of that. And when Solomon built the temple, they, they, they consecrated, it was all ready, blood from bulls and cows and goats everywhere because you are not getting the presence of this holy God and sinful man together. It's not going to happen without incredible sacrifice. But then, here you have the recording in that first king passage where the glory of the Lord descended onto that tabernacle. And that too was called 1 Kings 8.10. That when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of Yahweh. He was there in that temple. And inside that temple, I didn't bring up all the text because it's stretched out so much, but there's flowers and pomegranates and all these beautiful trees and things decorating the wall. And you read that and the scholars have pointed out that just totally visits Eden. That's like Eden. In other words, you blew it, you're independent, but if you want to get right with me, you come to me through an acceptable sacrifice. You get glimpses of Eden in the past, but then with the prophets and glimpses of what? paradise in the future. So he's saying, look, it's temporary, but man and God can dwell together again in this temple. Go to the next one, please. Inside that temple, we've opened the veil for you, but the veil would be closed. That's the Ark of the Covenant back there. On the Day of Atonement, you might know that as Yom Kippur, and you could read about that. One guy, one priest could do enough sacrifices. He's got to cleanse himself. He's got to cleanse that. And he goes in there, and then he puts the blood on the seat. That's the propitiation that Christ is. And then and only then could he experience the full holiness. It wasn't even the full holiness, but the presence of of God. If you could advance that for just a moment here. I think there's a Leviticus passage that nails it. He says, Then he shall slaughter the goat and the sin offering which is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood on the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat you can come to God through an acceptable sacrifice. If he deviated at all, he would drop dead. You don't play games with God. You come in through the death of an acceptable substitute. All of this is screaming what? We need an eternal, perfect, once-for-all substitute. That's exactly what Christ was. You can advance to the next slide. This is so powerful. This is at the crucifixion of Christ. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And they say it was about as thick as a human hand. And it ripped from the top to the bottom. What is that signifying? No more bulls. No more just the priest. Any loser like you or me, any sinner is welcome into the presence of God. Why? Because it wasn't a bull or a ram that was sacrificed. It was the divine Messiah. And he opens up that wide invitation. That's our invitation today. The veil is ripped. You don't need me. You don't need a priest. You don't need to raise lambs. Jesus Christ, the once for all sacrifice... When he said, it is finished, there's nothing between you and God. That veil is ripped wide open. Can I just say, enter it if you haven't? Enter it daily if you need to. Take your issues right to him. There's no sin issue between you and God. Christ removed it. Sure, our acts of rebellion will break up our fellowship. But you just come right back whenever you want. That is what we're talking about. But it was only a glimpse. He had greater plans. And that's why the, the, the prophet spoke of this future when God himself would come. Take, take a look at this. If you advance that for me one more time. Zechariah chapter 14. Absolutely love the book of Zechariah. I know we went through it a couple years ago. I think it was. But he says this. He says, then the Lord, there you have it all caps, right? We're talking about the person of Yahweh himself. Then the Lord Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. By the way, this, this is Armageddon, okay? Go ahead and advance that for me. In that day, his feet, whose feet? Yahweh's feet. Oh, excuse me, preacher. 
God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Spirits do not have feet. Does Yahweh have feet? Does Yahweh have feet? He does in this text. Because this text is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. In that day, his feet, Yahweh's feet, will stand on the Mount of Olives. All right, I'm going to give a homework assignment. Do a word study tonight on the Mount of Olives and you see who was on the Mount of Olives. It's going to be split in the middle from east to west, large valley, etc. So on that half of the mountain, we'll move forward to the north and the other half towards the south. I love the way Zechariah portrays Yahweh himself coming to reign on this planet and it is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. So when we attack the incarnation of God, we're attacking the entire story. And if God didn't come to man, then man is left what? Trying to get to God. And you will not find a group who denies the simple beauty of the gospel and who denies the incarnation of Yahweh who believes that simple message. They have a message that says man has to get to God. Listen to what they say when they knock on your door. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. That's exactly the heart of their message because they cannot fathom the concept that he came to us. And in one sense, you kind of got to get it, right? Maybe you've heard about the young Christian girl. She's about 10 years old and she's scared at bedtime. So she goes to bed and and mom and dad hear her from from the other room kind of crying. And uh, we'll just use Rosie today. Why not? Rosie, what's wrong, sweetie? I'm scared. I'm scared of the dark. It's okay, honey. God is with you. Okay, fine, but I want one with skin. Jesus Christ is Yahweh with skin. That doesn't satisfy a a seven-year-old girl, right? She's still, no, no, I want arms wrapped around me and I'm not at a place where I can take that by faith. So I get it. The idea of Yahweh and, and putting on skin, putting on flesh and blood, that is a radical concept for us, but that is exactly what the scriptures teach. Not once, <laughs> over and over and over again. And when we remove that concept, we, re- we have revised Christianity and we are left with a complete disaster. I love this one too. Just a few verses later, and then Yahweh will be king over all the earth. And in that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name, the only one fulfilled also in the person of Jesus. Go ahead there. I love this in Revelation chapter 22, right? We we saw in Genesis and Revelation, we've covered the whole narrative and this is what he says. He says, and he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming down from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. It's back. Remember the tree of life from Genesis? Bearing 12 kinds of fruits. The fruits are on the inside of that temple for the most part. Yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were there for the healings of the nation. So when you get to heaven, you will be glorified. You are going to get to go up to that tree of life. And partake of that, and it will solidify you. Your trials over, struggles gone, everything gone, and you will be now solidified in glory. Imagine being free from temptation. Oh, wow. If there was a price for admission, I'd pay it right there. But there is no price. It's been paid. Free from frustration. Free from my tempers. Free from my greed. Free from hope. Lee, that's going to be a good thing, he says, to be permanent. Do we see how important the narrative and the incarnation of God, it is not just an important theological sticking point. It is the very narrative of God pursuing his people. He manifested himself in the Old Testament. Little glimpses. Here, rebels, get a glimpse of what it might be like to enjoy my glory. And they called it the Shekinah glory. And if we could advance one more. Oh, sorry, I didn't finish the verse. No longer any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it and His bond servants will serve Him, right? There's that unity, man and God together again. But let's kind of wrap up our time here. 
He says back in 1 John, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar. Right? He says that repeatedly, like you can't just pick and choose between the Father and the Son. In other words, to deny Jesus is essentially to look right at God and go, liar. I'm not buying your story. I'm not buying your narrative. I'm following some clown who's twisted it all up and that's by very definition a cult. Why? Because he's not believed the testimony that God has given concerning his son. I'm telling you, I could write a book on showing the Messiah is divine right out of Genesis all the way to the end. And to deny that is to call God a liar. And the testimony is this that God has given us eternal life and that life is in his son. You can't deny that either. The reason for the incarnation of Yahweh is that we might have eternal life. And when you deny that, you're also denying eternal life. Now here it actually is a quality, but it's a quality that it offered and starts in a moment, but continues through all eternity. You have life in the son. Life in Christ. And if you don't, you don't have life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. What is the opposite of life? Death. And anarchy. And desperate people. I, I had two dialogues this week. Two different atheists. One of them quite aggressive. All over me. At the end of the day, I, I just said to him, I said, something has wounded you, bro. Something has wounded you deeply. And we just tag God into that. And it, it's just, it's not true atheism. It's a hatred for God. But this, that is a screaming reminder to all of us that he doesn't have life. And then, and thank you for your prayers. I did have a chance to do another service for Reardon. And uh, you won't really get an atheist to church very often. Maybe they keep mom happy on Mother's Day or something, but you just typically don't. But you know what an atheist will attend? A funeral. And if looks could kill, it would have been my funeral. But I would have died at about every funeral I have ever done. And you can spot them right away because the family gathers at the front and they always sit alone back and right away you read their face and you go, oh boy, here it comes. And I'm up there and I'm just encouraging love and I mean, it's just, I just, and the look on this man's face, he wanted me dead. I, I, I'm just convinced of it. What does that say to me? A lot of work to be done. There's a lot of grace to be given. I might be his enemy. He's not mine. He, he doesn't have life. What, 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 what do I expect? And we'll just close with this because I find this to be one of the neatest but probably one of the most overlooked things in Christianity. Same author here, this is John. And again, he is arguing extensively for the deity of Christ. He says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. So he was with God, he was withing. He was wasing. He was existing with God. Oh, and he was God. But then he gets down to verse 14. He says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us on skin. We saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. But see, here's the thing. Languages borrow from other languages, right? Amen. It's a Greek word. We took it. Baptism. It's a Greek word. We didn't like what was before us in our translating options, so we took it. I think hallelujah. I guess Hebrew. We, we borrow words. So did the Greeks. And the Greeks borrowed word I've mentioned here today is the Shekinah glory. They borrowed it. See, there's two words for dwell in the Greek language. One of which is rarely used, but it's the Greek, <clears throat> it's the Greek word Shekinah. Excuse me, Shekinah, hard F. That's what John chose to use here for dwell. Well, if we were to take the, I apologize for the technical difficulties today, if I was to take the word Shekinah, glory, and skenai, and then remove all the sounds that don't fit in the Greek language. There's no sh, it's a hard S. Move the sh sound, and suddenly I realize he's using the Greek version of Shekinah glory for dwell. 
Shekinah, Shekinah. Remove the, the H sound. What John just said, and he references glory, I promise you, this is what he had in mind. See, God didn't come anymore. No more fire. No more smoke. The glory of God, the Shekinah glory, is the visible manifestation of God in the person of his Son. That's exactly what John is saying. Jesus Christ is the Shekinah glory. And when you go back and you read Ezekiel when, when, when they had rebelled so bad and the glory of God left the temple and the glory of God coming back to the temple, what is it going to be? It's going to be Jesus Christ re-entering that temple in this thousand year reign and taking his seat. He is the manifestation of God. And have you placed your faith in him as such? And it's real simple and profound takeout today. Didn't rig deal, dig real deep necessarily on this one. But do you view life in that narrative? First comes faith. I believe in the divine who died for me. And then I place my life into that narrative, knowing what he's working towards. That would be his goal. As to the rest of the text, yeah, I took two points because if you've been here, you realize John is circling back to things that we've covered. But to do some additional reading, go through there and consider loving God as horizontal. You want to love God, love his children. I love what Joe said this morning. We're a family. We love each other. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace, we thank you that you would send your son who as crazy as it is, is actually you. God, very God with skin. What he accomplished for us in bringing us peace with you. Pray that we'd never stop being thrilled with that truth. That we would never stop being grateful for a God who so loved that he went on mission. Would we, Lord, join you in that mission to see as absolutely many people as possible come to place their faith in God with skin. Our precious Lord Jesus Christ, let that be our testimony. We thank you, and as we love you, remind us to love one another. Amen.